Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Professor Daniel Lieberman, Chairman of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. His latest book is called The Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease. Professor Lieberman, thanks so much for being part of the show. My pleasure. So you start out the book telling a story about a, a monkey that's on the loose in Tampa, Florida. Why did you start out with that story? Well, it's always good to kind of entertain people, uh, get people into a into the into a long book. But also, um, my point was that um, we um, we have a very kind of warped perception of what's normal, and uh, so the uh, the story of the mystery monkey is kind of fun because people were wondering what the hell a monkey was doing in Tampa, Florida. Um, but the point is that the monkey's uh, presence in Florida was no more abnormal than the most of the people who were wondering why what a monkey was doing there in the first place. So, so we're we're a bit like that mystery monkey in a way. Mm-hmm. Plus, it's fun to make you know lots of good jokes. So, you talk a lot about early human evolution in the the first part of your book. Can you tell me a few of the early adaptations that that started to differentiate? Um, this uh, early human called Australopithecus. Did I get that right from chimps? Well, um, Australopithecus actually came around four million years after we diverged from from um, uh, what four million years ago. But the very first hominins, so creatures more related to us than to chimps, um, are called either Ardipiths or or Sahelanthropus or Ardipithecus or Aurorin. So they're not quite actually Australopithecus at that point. But um, for the most part, they're 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 ape-like, but they're not, of course, apes, um, and they're bipeds. So they're probably very good at climbing trees, but there's uh, abundant evidence that they were upright bipeds and they walked they walked differently than us. For example, they're, they have very abducted or you know, divergent big toes on their feet, very long curved toes. They they were um, 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 they had very small brains, they had snouts. Um, um, they're um, they're they're bipedal, but they're um, but they're quite different from us. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that that I think about a lot is that uh, when we talk about er- early human evolution and and how w- when we've evolved to basically chase down antelope and eat meat, or at least that's a big part of our evolution, is that our teeth aren't very sharp. How? Why do we have such flat teeth um, if we've evolved to a- eat meat and chase down antelopes? Well, uh, our teeth um, are are the way they are because we evolved from apes who have flat teeth. So chimpanzees, for example, our closest to living relatives, have teeth that are, in many ways, at least their cheek teeth, are very much like ours. Um, they're designed for eating fruit. And um, and um, we started eating meat around two million years ago, two and a half million years ago. But that wasn't the only thing we ate. We still also ate fruits and we stayed, still ate tubers and vegetables. And in fact, much of the important differences of, in tooth shape that make us different from Australopithecus, uh, from, from the very earliest hominins and from, from apes occurred in Australopiths like Lucy. We mentioned Australopithecus early. And so these, um, these critters evolved to eat tubers and lots of underground storage organs. So it's true, we added meat to our diet around two and a half million years ago, but that's only one of the many components of our diet. Mm-hmm. And when we started eating meat, remember, we also had stone tools. So uh, humans can't eat meat very effectively without tools. Um, and so we, we, from the very earliest uh, times of eating meat, we probably used tools to, to uh, cut food into smaller particles as well as to tenderize, bash it up. Um, so, so tool making and meat eating uh, co-evolved in in our evolutionary history. Okay. Now you say in your book that our shift away from fruit actually helped build larger brains. How does that work? Well, brains are expensive. So, um, so a typical brain requires takes about twenty to twenty five percent of your basal metabolic rate. So, the energy necessary to kind of take care of your body, you're spending about a quarter of it to pay for just for your brain. 
So brains are costly, um, uh, a costly organ. And in addition, brains, big brains, uh, create troubles in terms of how to giving birth, and they they uh, they take it takes longer to grow up when you have a big brain. So uh, in order to have a big brain, you need to have more energy. And where did where did our ancestors get that much energy from? And the answer is likely that an important source for that energy was was carnivory, was meat, because. Because uh, um, you know we, we evolved from creatures that um, you know chimpanzees do like to eat meat, but they get very little of their diet from meat, maybe one to three uh, percent. If they're males, females basically get no meat ever, um, and they're they're very inefficient at chewing meat. Um, but chimpanzees at least are very athletic. They're they're fast. They're 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 powerful. As soon as we became bipeds, we lost those abilities. So it's probable that for for millions of years, our ancestors got even less meat than chimpanzees did. And so it wasn't until around two two and a half million years ago. With the evolution of hunting and gathering, that we became, um, we learned to become, we, we started becoming carnivores, at least partial carnivores. And as you alluded to earlier, part of that involved running, because after all, it's pretty hard to be a carnivore without being able to run. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of running. Um, I know last time we talked, we spent some time talking about this, but for people who might might not have heard that, what are some of the main adaptations that that point to humans evolving as distance runners? Gosh, well, they're literally from our heads to our toes. So, um, so let's start with toes. So we have short toes. We have springs on our feet. We have short heel bones, short calcanei, uh, which actually increase the energetic storage of the Achilles tendon. The Achilles tendon is a very important spring. About 30% of the energy of your body hitting the ground gets stored up and released then in, in the, in the Achilles tendon alone. Um, we have long legs. We have very large joints in our lower bodies. We have, um, Femoral necks that are optimally designed for producing running forces. We have um, very large vertebral bodies in our in our in our um, in our lower backs that help distribute the forces. Uh, we have um, lost a lot of the connection between our shoulders and our heads that enable us to be able to rotate our thorax independently of our heads. We have semi vestibular systems in our head that are specially well tuned to sensing the pitching forces that are caused by running. Uh, we have um, incredible thermoregulatory systems, such as the ability to sweat, uh, loss of fur. Um, I could go on. <laughs> there are many, many features that you use in your body that make us extremely good at running long distances. We're not fast. We're not good sprinters, but we're remarkable at running very, very long distances. And if I understand it right, the, the main reason that evolution pushed us in that direction towards distance runners is because the forests were changing and our diets were changing, as we discussed earlier. And and uh, we needed to, I don't know if we needed to, but we had the the availability to hunt down meat by chasing them um, or to hunt down antelope by chasing them. Can you elaborate right. on that a little? Well, it's, yeah. So um, if you're in a very open habitat and you're a primate, um, they're not that, there are not many foods to eat, right? We're... Our ancestors ate fruits, but they also ate underground storage organs. They, um, they ate a very diverse diet. But as grasslands started expanding, and that's a long and complex process. It didn't sort of happen all at once, and it didn't happen in a simple linear way. It went through back and forth um, uh, oscillations. But the important point is that um, the expansion of those grasslands provided new foods for a wide variety of species. So we evolved at the same time as a lot of the major carnivores evolved, and we also are a kind of carnivore, but we're a different kind of carnivore. And so our ancestors who had the ability to get uh, meat more effectively must have had a selective advantage over those who didn't. So so hunting was probably selected for, the ability to hunt was probably selected for over very long periods of time. And it might have started, for example, as scavenging. Mm-hmm. And as I said before, because remember, uh, hunting provides very high quality resources. You get a lot more calories and you get fat and you get all kinds of nutrients from meat that you don't get from vegetables. There's a reason we place a higher value in general on meat than on vegetables. That's because of the caloric and other nutrient content. But but um, so it was never, you know, solely carnivores. We were obviously just a component of the diet. Um, and so the hypothesis is that individuals who were better able to scavenge or hunt uh, millions of years ago suffered, had a, had a fitness benefit, right? They had more offspring who then survived. And that led, that's how natural selection works. So, so individuals, for example, had larger gluteus maximus. So that's another feature I just uh, didn't mention that's very important for running. So, so individuals had a slightly larger gluteus maximus might have been slightly better able at running than individuals with smaller butts. 
Mm-hmm. And so uh, over time, that leads to um, uh, individual, individuals with bigger butts basically pack, passing on the genes that confer larger gluteus maximus uh, if there is variation in the population. And so that's probably true for many of the features that are important in our bodies. And then once that happens, that releases um, um, constraints on selection for other things, such as big brains, right? So, so most animals don't have big brains. It's not that big brains aren't useful. It's that big brains are costly. Everything has a trade-off. So big brains are beneficial in the sense that they, they make you smarter, but they're also costly in the sense that they require a lot of energy. So until you have enough energy to pay for the big brain, the costs probably outweigh the benefits. So in our ancestors, uh, once the running and, and throwing and other abilities that helped us become hunters evolved, then that allowed for selection for other things, such as language, big brains, and, and what have you. Okay. You know, the, uh, the second part of your book I found especially interesting, and you, you introduced this topic uh, called the mismatch hypothesis hypothesis, which is that um, humans are basically not su- well suited to their modern environment. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that mismatch hypothesis? Well, it's not that we're not suited. It's just that that our, our bodies are a complex jumble of adaptations, which evolved over millions of years, right? We're not evolved for any one thing. And uh, there's no question that people living in the 21st century are doing better than we have probably ever in our history, right? Uh, we're living longer. Uh, we have less infant mortality. But it's also true that um, that there are many diseases that we're getting that used to be extremely rare. Um, heart disease, for example, uh, type 2 diabetes, flat feet, myopia, uh, all of these things used to be extremely un- uh, rare, and that's because uh, there are many aspects of our bodies which are which are poorly adapted or inadequately adapted for the environments we've created today. And those, no, those, are, those diseases that result from those that in- inadequate adaptation are called mismatch diseases. I did not invent the term. It's been around for a while. Mm-hmm. And um, um, and in fact, I would argue that um, you know it's hard to test a lot of these mismatch diseases because we don't have enough data on hunter-gatherer health to be definitive about all of them. But um, the evidence is that probably most of the diseases that people suffer from today are are mismatch diseases. Mm-hmm. Heart disease, for example, is the number one killer of Americans, and, and arguably it's it's uh, it's uh, it's become much more prevalent and much more severe in recent times because of our diets and lack of physical activity. We're not well adapted to being it. it you know, uh, um, you know, to eating high sugar, high carb, high fat diets, and we're just and we're not in, adapted very well to being uh, physically inactive. It's pathological, and the result is heart disease. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a, a lady named Marlene Zuck on a few weeks ago, and she wrote a book called Paleo Fantasy, and she would argue that things like low back pain aren't a result of us sitting in chairs all day, but she says that it's really a result of uh, a poor poor evolution. I guess is what I got from it is that uh, standing upright isn't a very you know, it has a lot of downsides. What's your view on things like low back pain? Well, <clears throat> what's her evidence? She uh, actually presents no evidence to support that. It's a it's a contention. So um, it's it's often stated that 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 being having lower back pain is a result of being a biped. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's just stated, and that's a, that's just assumed without um, without testing. Um, and it is true that there are many things that we have that um, that are problems because of um, because of um, uh, you know there there are byproducts of evolutionary history. But actually, there's no compelling evidence to support her hypothesis because or that, that the common assumption. Uh, because actually it turns out that um, uh, the evidence that there exists, and it's not very good evidence, but that, that lower back pain is actually much more common today than it used to be. And the evidence is that, that people who, who uh, use their backs um, uh, more moderately actually suffer from lower back pain less than people who use them very extremely or people who don't use them at all. Mm. And so, yes, we have evidence that, for example, uh, we actually published a paper that was on the cover of Nature a few years ago showing that there's been selection for uh, um, for strengthening the back in women to deal with uh, the, the back mechanical com- problems of, of pregnancy, but but the extent to which, say, people have suffered from lower back pain for the last few million years is, is conjecture, um, and we don't know that to be the case, and it's entirely possible that a large percentage of lower back pain that occurs today, in fact, there's compelling evidence that a, that a, a fair percentage of it, not all of it, results from the fact that we sit around in chairs all day having weak backs, we sleep in, in beds that, uh, that are very soft and cushiony, but those also lead to weaker backs. We, um, we, are, we are, we are, we are, we're weak and inactive, and that, of course, increases the probability that you'll get lower back pain. So I would, um, I would argue you have to be very careful about making assumptions about evolution without data. And I would argue that in this particular case, um, it's probably much more complex than she claims. Okay. 
Uh, let's, you know, one uh, evolutionary mismatch, or I, I don't know if this fell under the topic of disevolution or mismatch, but myopia was extremely interesting. I hadn't heard this before, but uh, this idea that the reason that we're becoming, our, our vision deteriorates is because we work in such close environments all the time. Can you tell me a little bit more about that research? <laughs> So myopia is, a, is it used to be extremely uncommon um, until, um, for example, uh, until the 19th century when universal literacy became um, more common in developed nations in the industrialized West. Myopia was 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 extremely rare, and uh, since then, of course, it's become so common that it it's afflicts between a third and fifty percent of people in most developed nations, and it's caused by having an overly long eyeball. And there's two pathways that have been implicated in causing an overly long eyeball. One is that um, a lot of close work, you know, being focusing constantly on things that are close uh, up to your eye, requires you to contract con contract the muscles in your around your lens called the ciliary muscles, which then raise the pressure inside the cavity of your eyeball, which then causes it to elongate. If you, if you add pressure to a balloon, it'll expand, right? And you can't expand at the front or the bands, the back, so it expands in the middle, elongating the eyeball. And there's a fair amount of evidence that kids who read more and people who might cross and you know, tailors and people are constantly focusing on things a lot all the time um, uh, are more subject to myopia. But there's also evidence for another pathway that's caused by inadequate visual stimulus. So, if, for example, poor little kittens whose eye eyelids had been sewn shut because of experiments, not, not ones that I've done, hmm. um, uh, turn out to develop overly long eyeballs as well, even though they never looked at anything in their life with the, that eye. Um, and that's because uh, the evidence shows, and there's other compelling experiments to show that, you know, glasses, for example, which which obfuscate um, or, um, a vision, uh, disturb somehow some regulation of the growth of the eyeball from the retina. And so the retina uh, helps uh, regulate the growth of the eyeball based on visual stimulus. So if you, if you, if you give an eye uh, inadequate visual stimulus, or, uh, then, then the eyeball doesn't regulate its growth properly. So uh, the data show that, for example, children who spend more time out of doors are much less likely to become myopic, i.e. have a long eyeball, um, after you correct for how much reading they do than children who spend more, um, um, more time indoors. So, so it's probable that there's more than one pathway. And again, these are interacting with genes, so there's all gene-environment interactions. Um, but the point is that we're... Um, we're we're creating environments. We're not passing on on you know people aren't becoming more myopic uh, because we're passing on because we're passing on those genes. They're becoming more myopic because we're passing on those environments. And then what we do is we treat myopia with well, eyeglasses, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no selection against it. There's no we're not we're not preventing the causes of myopia. And hence we're driving a positive feedback loop. So that's keeping um, that's keeping the the disease prevalent. But it's it's keeping it prevalent through cultural evolution, not through biological evolution, because we're passing on culture, i.e. reading, which is a novel thing that we used to read a long time ago, or spending a lot of time indoors, which is obviously something that people were not able to do until very recently. We're passing on those environments to our children, which then interact with ancient genes to create myopia generation after generation after generation. And it's that feedback loop, which is a cultural a form of cultural change. Well, it's a cultural process that causes biological change, which I call dis-evolution. Mm -hmm. And is there any hope of uh, reversing that or preventing that? That. Well, some kinds of disevolution we just kind of put up with, right? I mean, maybe I mean, we all think that reading is a good thing, right? I mean, a few people are going to say, oh, <laughs> don't read because you might become myopic. I mean, wait till you hear parents tell their kids that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it may be that um, that there's certain, there, everything involves trade-offs, and that might be a price we have to pay for, for literacy, which obviously brings benefits. Um, although perhaps we can learn to make books more visually stimulating uh, and um, uh, maybe give kids reading glasses more. There's a lot of interesting ideas out there about how to kind of halt this cycle for myopia. Um, cavities are another example. I mean, um, uh, cavities are caused by eating foods that are rich in starch. Um, now, are we going to get rid of all grains and cereals and rice and potatoes? And you did that, you would cause massive famines and, you know, billions of people would die. So we put up with um, we put up with high starch, high carbohydrate diets um, and, the, and the problems they cause, among them cavities, because they bring other benefits, such as uh, they enable us to uh, feed our children so uh, we and then we and we take our kids to the dentist so so some forms of disevolution I believe are probably acceptable uh, trade-offs to most people mm -hmm. others um, aren't necessary I suspect I think that heart disease for example is something that we should um, we should actively fight more uh, through prevention and that of course means changes in diet but also
also even more importantly changes in exercise. Mm. You know, I, I thought that was really interesting, the thing about cavities, how there was a dentist named Weston Price who traveled around the world and looked at uh, people who were eating more ancient diets, I guess, didn't have as many cavities as some of the more industrialized nations. Um, is it possible that cavities are sort of like a canary in the cave, pointing us to maybe stay away from high starch and high sugar diets? Well, look, everything involves trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. there, are, there are benefits and costs. To the to the to, to industrial well not not so industrial but to agricultural diets right if we lived as hunter gatherers today in the old in the old days <clears throat> you and I wouldn't be alive mm -hmm. um, 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 we can't feed as many people as there are with um, on a on a paleolithic diet it's just not going to happen it's not possible so um, um, but that said um, we don't need to need to feed them uh, in, in with, with uh, diets that are as processed and are as starchy and as carbohydrate rich as, as we as many people um, uh, do eat. And so I think there's a balance to be struck. So there's no question that um, um, many modern processed foods um, and high sugar diets and very starchy diets are unhealthy. I don't think anybody disputes that. Well, nobody sensible or credible disputes that. Um, but that doesn't mean we should completely remove all carbohydrates from our from our lives, particularly if you're very physically active. I mean, uh, don't go tell. I mean, I'm a runner, for example. You know, it's very hard to to run 40, 50, 60 miles a week and not eat a lot of carbohydrates. Um, go tell all the Kenyan runners I know who, who are running <laughs> huge amounts. Right? They're, they're pretty healthy folks, and they're eating they're eating diets that would make a paleo diet person you know faint. Right? Um, <laughs> and but I don't I don't see a lot of pot bellies and heart disease and whatever among those guys. They're they're pretty remar remarkable human beings. That's because because exercise confers all kinds of benefits that are very important. Right? They for example high levels of vigorous activity can actually resensitize. Uh, insulin receptors and shuttle, you know, change, it changes the way you, you digest and process carbohydrates. So, so it's very complicated. There are no simple answers to anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. Weston Price was right uh, up to a point, but only up to a point. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you agree basically with this idea that's been uh, pushed around the past couple of years that insulin is a big contributor to getting fat and that if we eat diets that are high in, in starch and, and uh, carbs, that those are primarily what makes us fat? I think the evidence is very strong in that regard. Sure, I mean, there's no question that um, well, insulin is 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 part of the process that makes you fat. Um, um, and high glycemic foods, there's no question that um, they they promote obesity in through a number of mechanisms. Um, a simple one is that. When you eat a very high glycemic food, right, food that causes your insulin levels to rise, blood sugar levels to rise very high, and then your insulin levels rise very high, you usually overshoot, and then you then have an insulin crash, which makes you hungrier, and then you end up eating more. Um, it's also true that whenever you eat these those, those calories, insulin's job is basically turned into fat. So um, if you're not burning it, but if you're eating a very high glycemic diet and you're exercising, you, the effect is somewhat different. Hmm. Fructose is another matter. Fructose goes, of course, to your liver. Uh, fructose doesn't cause insulin levels to rise. Fructose is handled by your liver, which then can do a variety of things with it. Mostly it can burn it, but not very fast, so it can turn it into fat. That, or it can do what's called gluconeogenesis and then convert that into glucose, which then causes your insulin levels to rise. The bottom line is that our bodies are clearly not adapted to eat high amounts of carbohydrate or sugar at very rapid rates. Um, all, no matter what it is, and th those kinds of foods um, do cause troubles, especially if you're physically inactive. Okay. So yes, I think if, the, if there's any one evil out there that's causing um, um, the obesity epidemic, it's probably starch and sugar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've tried to orient my lifestyle a little bit more towards the paleolithic maybe small steps i i have a really dim light on right now because it's at night and i'm working at a standing desk are are there things like that that we can do to our environment that you see as uh benefits and ha have you introduced any of those types of things into your lifestyle well i think yeah we have, one has to be very thoughtful and careful about you know um um of these things of course i mean it's uh, you know what we're, we're you know what the bodies that everything involves trade-offs i think that's the important point so we all make compromises in our lives and every time you do one thing you can't do something else so um, but but some things have higher costs than others and I would argue that um, physical inactivity for example is, has a very high cost uh, to our bodies uh, so um, I do lots of things right to try to remain physically active I, I run I try to take the stairs in, in my in my building I I, um, I try to wear minimal shoes because I think it strengthens my feet uh, rather than wear shoes that are um, heavily cushioned with orthotics um, I um, you know I'm careful about eating processed foods with lots of sugar and carbohydrates um, so yes I think um, 
all of us can and should, uh, if we want to, that is, um, 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 do things in our lives that um, that are more in tune with uh, how our bodies evolve to function. Um, but there's also things that are novel. For example, I don't, um, you know, if I get a, if I were to get um, the bubonic plague tomorrow, I can promise you I am going to go get antibiotics, which did not exist in the Paleolithic. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not opposed to refrigeration. I'm not opposed to, here we are communicating via computer. Um, I've not gotten rid of all the chairs in my house. Um, you know, we all have trade-offs and compromises. I think we just need to be thoughtful about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you see any role of mental illness playing any of these disevolution or mismatch diseases? Oh, surely, but um, it's not really my focus, so I'm not a, I'm not an expert on on uh, on mental illness. But uh, there's compelling evidence that anxiety, depression, ADHD, a wide variety of mental health issues are exacerbated by um, by physical inactivity um, mm-hmm. and sometimes also by diet. Um, you know, it's again as I said before, it's abnormal and pathological to be physically inactive and physical activity upregulates serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all kinds of neurotransmitters that are very important in in regulating brain function. So we know that uh, people who are more active are much likely uh, to not get, you know, much less likely to develop Alzheimer's. There, it's physical activity is better treatment for depression than any known pharmaceutical. Uh, anxiety as well. Um, uh, you know, I think these are all, to some extent, they're not completely mismatched diseases because, you know, anxiety, depression are, are also adaptations, right? It's it's, an, it's adaptive to be anxious about something sometimes. It can help you um, modulate your behavior appropriately, It's but it's maladaptive to be, you know, chronically anxious. Mm. It's maladaptive to be constantly stressed. Um, so these, 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 these behaviors aren't all bad, but they're bad in excess, and oftentimes the way we live uh, promotes, um, promotes these makes these disease more extreme or more more common uh, stress is a good example right it's caused by for example lack of sleep if you don't sleep enough uh, you're too hungry because you to have more of a flight and fight response and it elevates you know uh, ele- elevates insulin that causes a whole suite of problems chronic stress um, that um, um, that we can avoid by for example exercising more and sleeping more um, that's not so hard to do but um, sadly people have a hard time um, changing their lives sometimes mm-hmm. in the last part of your book you talk about some of the solutions that we might take uh, to try to prevent some of these uh, mismatched diseases and you advocate for something called libertarian paternalism which can you give me a little bit of or the listeners a little bit of an idea of what you mean by that well you know people have the right to be unhealthy right if i if i want to smoke cigarettes and eat donuts and you know become a sedentary fat blob it's my right (laughs) Um, um, and you don't have the right to tell me not to do it but a lot of people uh, don't want to become unhealthy. They just don't um, know how to help themselves. Often we make decisions that are irrational or not in our own self best interest. And if we had, if we were able to behave more rationally, um, we would often do the right thing. But we need sometimes help to do the right thing. That's why we often, uh, you know, tell children what to do because they can't often make their own decisions in their own self interest. Well, adults are no different. Except adults, we we, we give adults more rights than children. So. It's a general philosophy that um, that's not my my idea, but um, sort of growing in certain economic and behavioral um, behaviorists is the, is the idea of paternalistic libertarianism, which is to essentially arrange our environments in such a way to help us make decisions that we would rationally make in our own self best interest without forcing us. So these are nudges, for example, incentives um, or, for example, most people would like to give, uh, we all think that maybe it's good to have organ donation, but, you know, it's kind of hard to, to do it. So if you make that the default when you get your driver's license, that's a nudge to help you. So you can check the box saying you don't want to give an organ, mm-hmm. but that's a nudge that kind of helps you make that decision um, 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 more easily. Um, uh, so I would argue that um, that government and other social institutions can help us make decisions that are in our own self-interest, help us help us help ourselves. So one example would would be um, seatbelt laws, right, which basically help people uh, make decisions that otherwise they they wouldn't otherwise make, but which are certainly in their in their self interest. Uh, taxes would be an example of that. So taxes on cigarettes and alcohol um, are nudges, right? They don't prevent you from smoking, they don't prevent you from drinking, but they make it a little bit less. 
um, um, ex, uh, cheap and they make it more prohibitive. And so people smoke less and they drink less because of alcohol taxes and cigarette taxes. Well, why not do the same thing with junk food? Mm-hmm. Um, junk food isn't healthy. Let's not pretend it is. Um, it's addictive. Um, why don't we tax junk food the way we tax cigarettes? Um, that would be a nudge. It doesn't prevent anybody from drinking, from, from eating the stuff, but it, it makes it less desirable. It helps maybe push people more towards healthier foods. Uh, the list could be very long. For, you can also have uh, nudges. You can also prevent people from nudging us the wrong way. So, you know, there are a lot of foods out there. You can go to the supermarket. You can see these foods that are labeled, you know, fat free. Right. And they're just sugar. <laughs> well, technically, right. those are fat free, but your body turns them straight into fat. In fact, arguably, your body makes more fat out of them than foods that are equally caloric, but actually have fat in them. Right. Mm. So uh, that's actually deceptive advertising in a way. And, and it's true to one extent, but it's also very much false from your body. Body's perspective. So maybe we can uh, enact laws that help people help prevent us being from nudged in the wrong way, uh, such as through uh, deceptive advertising of foods as healthy, which are actually not healthy. Um, so I think we as a society have to figure since we can't change our genes, we have to change our environments. And since we can't take away rights, let's let's collectively think about ways that we can help each other make decisions that are all in our own self best interest. Because um, after all, you know, if, when, if you if you decide to become a blob and eat donuts and stop exercising, I'm going to have to pay for your health care, too. Right. So we're all in this together uh, and we can all help each other. But we also need to respect each other's rights. And that's really what libertarian paternalism is about. OK. You know, when I. When I read that part of your book, part of me paused a little because for the past 50 years, the government has been saying to eat 9 to 11 servings of grain a day, you know, kind of a high starch, high carb diet. And it just made me think, how confident am I that the government can um, know what's good for me? Get it right. Yeah. And with the amount of money that's involved in politics, what do you think about that? We're all flawed individuals and scientists. You know, the government did that because there were a bunch of scientists who got it wrong, too. Mm -hmm. So how do you know what I'm saying is right? Or how do you know that the books that you're reading about the paleo diet or whatever are right. You don't. You're mm-hmm. doing the best you can with the information that's available. And maybe 15, 20 years from now, we'll have more evidence to disprove or, or prove or support what, what, what we're doing. We're, we can only do the best that we can and under the context or situations that we have. And right now, the evidence points towards low carb diets as being healthier than than than, than low fat diets. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, but 20 years ago, nobody would have been telling you that. Um, and 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 um, and that's science is not a simple process. Science is done by human beings who, who propose hypotheses, and then it's our job to try to reject them. And and consumers of science, we're all consumers of science, science including scientists. We all have to be skeptical, um, but government is a, is a consumer of science just as well as everybody else. So we, we march backwards into the future. We we, we make mistakes. Um, we shouldn't um, vilify people who get it wrong, but rather we should just keep pressing, keep questioning, keep scrutinizing, keep keep moving forward. And eventually we make progress. And uh, and this is going to be no different than any other process. Mm-hmm. So so yes, government doesn't necessarily get it all right. And there are industry you know lobbyists out there who are who are perverting the entire system. And it's up to you and me and others through education, through writing books, through podcasts, through whatever, to try to get the best information out there, help people make their own decisions, evaluate for themselves how to use their bodies. And 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 and, and again, this is not going to be done in any one by any one group. It's not going to be done just by individuals. It's going to take government as well. It's going to take many different kinds of social institutions, but we're not going to be able to do this without government. Mm-hmm. Um, um, we're, we're, it's going to take um, it's going to take every aspect of our society to to turn around what's been a very um, troubling uh, uh, phenomenon of recent years, which is the, the rise of chronic non-infectious diseases. Mm-hmm. Well, Professor <laughs> Lieberman, your book was extremely interesting. I thank you so much for taking the time tonight to come on the show. My pleasure. Take care. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.